Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, uh, depending on what time it is of day. Um, my name is Nathan Deal, and I'm the Assistant Inspector General for Inspections. And I'm here to talk to you today briefly about what it is that the Office of Inspector General does, a quick introduction to uh, what our office does for the uh, Government Publishing Office. Uh, today's March 23rd, but hopefully you're looking at this at uh, you know some future point in time. Now, the idea behind this deck is that we want to basically demystify the Office of Inspector General uh, for the for anyone who's watching this. It's a little bit of a peek behind the curtain. So hopefully you walk away with you know what it is that the Office of Inspector, Inspector General does and then what it is that we need from you, uh, the members of the Government Publishing Office, in order to help us do our jobs better. So what I'm going to do is walk through this agenda. So I'll talk a little bit about who we are, uh, the evolution of the IG, a quick history lesson, not too, not too in-depth. Uh, but I really want to touch on the point of IG independence, because that's really what makes us unique within the government. I'll talk about what your role is as a GPO employee, and then our organization, investigations, audits, and inspections are how we do uh, the work of the Office of Inspector General. And of course, you're probably asking yourself, well, what does that mean? What kind of products do we produce? And I'll talk about that. And then at the end of the, the deck, I want to leave you with where you can report uh, issues to us or essentially, you know, how to get a hold of the Office of Inspector General. So on the next slide, you know, who are we? Um, when you think about in an Office of Inspector General, I want you to think of words like promoting economy, uh, efficiency, effectiveness. You know, those are the words that we think of when we think of an Office of Inspector General. You know, IGs are throughout the federal government and they're unique within their organizations. And what they're there to do is make that organization run better. Uh, and that's where the uh, effectiveness and efficiency comes into play. But there's another role for the Office of Inspector General, and that's to prevent and detect fraud, waste, and abuse. That's specific to the organizations that uh, where the um, IGs are embedded within the federal government. So in the government publishing office, as of course we're publishing the, the federal record and the FDLPs, uh, we let out a lot of contracts and we do passports. All those areas would be areas that we as an inspector general want to have oversight of. And then again, help promote the effectiveness efficiency and of course uh, detect and prevent fraud, waste and abuse. Now, all that's to say is you really probably should think of the Office of Inspector General as a watchdog. Uh, that's how they refer to us in the public forum. Uh, when, if you listen to news briefings, you'll hear Department of Justice watchdog finds Mueller report insufficient. You know, that wasn't a real tagline, but that's, those are the types of things you hear in the news when you, when you hear about Offices of Inspector General. So we're watchdogs and we're all levels of government, both federal, state, and local. And you can see from this slide that there's 74 federal IGs now. So think Department of State, Department of Interior, all the way down to the Government Publishing Office. Of course, there's different ways that IGs can be appointed, either by the president or by the agency head, and those vary depending on the size of the organization and different types. But at the end of the day, we're watchdogs for the organization. And then I want to point out something special too, like what does being a watchdog mean? Well, a lot of times that equates into dollars. You know, we are the watchdogs of the taxes or taxpayers' money. Uh, I put in a graphic here that talks about the last five years from 2013 to 2017. You know, IGs identified over 200 billion in savings, and some of that was actually recovered through investigations. Well, that's a lot of money. 200 bill, billion is, you know, that's 100 B-2 stealth bombers or, you know, 17 new aircraft carriers uh, right now. And 17 new aircraft carriers would essentially double our fleet. So it's hard to put that in perspective, but that's, that's certainly a lot of money, especially when you look at it at the overall uh, income and budget of GPO. It's quite a significant amount of money. So I'm going to go to the next slide and talk a little bit about the history uh, of the IG. Now, IGs go back as far back as the Revolutionary War and with General Washington. Uh, he was not satisfied with how the Continental Army was organized, especially against the superior fighting force of the British. So he asked Congress to give him an inspector general based off of European standards, and they did. Uh, and so through the military, inspector generals have really been around for over 200 years now. Now, within the 1970s, there were a lot of uh, large 
government organizations like agriculture that were having problems. So there were lots of scandals in the 50s and 60s um, with, with government organizations. And all the way into the 70s, President Carter signed in the IG Act, which basically said, I need watchdogs uh, within the major federal organizations. And that's where that came about. Now, I've highlighted the next one, which is 1988. Now, through Title 44, the IG Act was amended to allow GPO, that's us, to have an Office of Inspector General. So we came around about 10 years longer than most of the federal IGs. Now, the rest of the legislation that's happened through, that, through the last uh, couple decades or so have all gone to strengthening the independence of the office. And that's when you can see, as you can see in the 2008, 2016, and even just last December with the Legislative Independence Act, that actually gave GPO, our organization, the same levels of independence as other um, executive branch OIGs had. So let me put stop this point. Uh, independence makes us IGs unique, and that, that's really the key to what an inspector general does. Remember, the idea is that you have this independent organization providing oversight to a government entity. So in order to avoid those conflicts of interest, or as the picture shows, the fox guarding the hen house, you have to have certain protections in place. And that's where these IG acts and laws have come into place. Um, so what does that mean? Well, that means that, you know, the IG can't be fired or can't be hired willy-nilly by an agency director or even by the president. There has to be a process. What you don't want is an agency to just be able to get rid of the IG, especially if the IG says something or has a report out that is potentially contentious to the agency. The bottom line is that you don't want to be fired for what you want to put out. The IGs need to be able to put out independent, objective, and honest reports. And sometimes with all agencies, that those, those might not be, you know, the you know, glowing reports, but it, it's important that the truth come out. That goes the same way goes for budget. You know, the IG needs to have a separate budget so that it can't be uh, choked off by the agency. You know, if the agency was able to control our budget, they could just limit it to the point where we couldn't do audits, inspections, and investigations. So all those things are protections that the acts have been put into place. You know, the thing is we have our own counsel. Uh, a lot of us have our own law enforcement authority, GPO included. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later here. But the foot stomp is, is think of us as our own agency within an agency. So we are independent of GPO, but work with and actually rely on GPO for certain items, but we are independent. So let me go to the next slide. And you know, I talked about independence, but that doesn't mean that we work in a vacuum. And in fact, a lot of the information we rely on comes specifically from the employees of GPO. I've worked in several different offices of Inspector General and the most often uh, types of reports we get of wrongdoing are from the employees themselves. So I want to talk about a little bit about the expectations of GPO employees. You know, there is an obligation, as all government federal employees, that we must report a violation of any law, rule, or regulation, a mismanagement of funds, or um, abuse of authority, uh, and then any type of substantial or specific danger to public health or safety. Those are the things that we would expect you as employees to report to us. Now, I put this whistleblower graphic on the slides because I want you to understand that these are protected disclosures. So if you tell us these things, first of all, they can be confidential. And second of all, you're protected against reprisal if, let's say, a supervisor decided that he didn't like what you reported, they found out about it, and then they wanted to dock your pay or not give you a promotion or, or even fire you. Those things are illegal and they can't be done. So there's a whistleblower protection aspect to this, and I'll talk about that on the last slide. But again, we don't get our information in a vacuum, and we really rely on government employees and GPO employees to help us do our jobs better. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about our organization. You know, we've got our inspector general. That's Mike Leary. We've got a deputy inspector general and some front office staff. Again, I talked about how the IG has to have his own legal counsel. Again, you, the you know, Office of General Counsel, Counsel represents the agency. Our legal counsel represents the Inspector General. But where the rubber meets the road is those three boxes on the bottom. That's the uh, AIG, Assistant Inspector for General for Audits, Inspections, and Investigations. Those, you know, audits and investigations are really how an IG does its business. So let me talk uh, about each one of these individually. So investigations first. Who are investigators? Well, honestly, think about TV. 
these are the guys that um, are detectives on TV. They, they, ha- they carry a badge. They have law enforcement authority. Our investigators can issue subpoenas. They can make arrests on GPO, on GPO property for uh, conduct within GPO operations. Um, and they can also detect uh, and prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. So the types of things they'll investigate are fraud, uh, potential high-risk, systematic vulnerabilities within GPO's programs, serious employee integrity matters. Those are the things they're going to do. So let me put it another way. With an investigation, there's usually an allegation of wrongdoing, uh, and they're going to go and investigate that just like a detective will, will do, and they'll either substantiate it or unsubstantiate it, uh, and that's at the end of the day what they'll do. Now, they can do some proactive things. Uh, this is not an example here, but in my last organization, our investigators would look at the badge readers um, from the uh, whole agency and put that against the um, – we had this thing called PeopleSoft, which was looking at the time and attendance of people. So they would look at the badge readers, look at how they recorded their time, and the differences uh, could potentially be something of uh, disciplinary action. Now, we're not doing that here. We don't have badge readers here, but that's just an example of a proactive type of investigation that we could do. For example, we could look at all the contracts that the agency is letting out to see if there's any systematic vulnerabilities of fraud, uh, and that's something that our investigators would take a look at. Now I'm going to go over to audits, and and the goal of an audit, again, think back to the beginning when I discussed um, effectiveness and efficiency. The whole goal of an audit is to improve GPO programs and activities. The difference between our audit organization and other audit organizations within the federal government is our audits are specifically focused on the finances. So that's why you see money on the slide. So if there's a, a review or an evaluation or a look into the how GPO is spending money, letting contracts out, the financial statement audit, our audits group is going to handle that. Now, on the slide, I've got this big yellow block that, call, that says government auditing standards, and that's the generally accepted government auditing standards, or GAGAS. That's the yellow book. Those are the standards that they have to apply to. And so that's another difference between an audit and, say, an inspection um, is the types of different standards. And I'll touch base on that real quick when I look at the inspections division. So, again, our goal, too, is to improve GPO programs and operations. But our focus is going to be more on program management of an issue or an organization. So we recently looked at the next generation passports uh, within SID and how whether or not they were ready to um, produce the next generation passports. And, of course, we found that they were. uh, So that's a good news story there. An example of an audit would be the financial statement audit. So the difference there is the focus. Now, another difference you could look at is our standards and inspections are are designed to be more flexible, uh, which also can translate into more timely. So we don't have the same restrictions that an audit has in the yellow book as we do in the blue book. And that's really why inspections were created throughout the IG community, was to give a more flexible and tailored uh, approach. But, of course, another way for our group is that, you know, we're going to be focused on program management and operations of GPO. So what's the difference? Well, I've already kind of talked about it, but the difference between, you know, audits and inspections here at GPO is really an apples-to-apples comparison. At the end of the day, we're both trying to promote effectiveness and efficiency, but inspections are going to be focused on program management and audits are going to be focused on the finances. Now, you're probably sitting there, talking to yourself like, well, who cares? You know, we, they do an audit, they do an investigation, they do an inspection. You know, what do we get out of it? Well, at the end of the day, we're going to produce a report. I mean, that's, those are the widgets that we make, reports. The investigation does a report of investigation. That will either substantiate or unsubstantiate an allegation. We're going to do a report of our findings of what it is that we looked at. So the audit is going to – they did, recently did a purchase card. Uh, audit, and they found that there were some areas where the agency could improve in how we're documenting uh, purchase cards. Again, I we're looking at e-waste right now within the agency, uh, we being inspections. So out of those things, you're going to get a report, and those reports are going to have our findings and our observations, and if things are going really well, even what's called a commendable. And a commendable is when there's a best practice within the agency that should be shared throughout, or maybe even beyond the agency into the federal government. Uh, I do have examples of those. You know, in my last operation, uh, there was uh, an inspection we did 
where uh, an Air Force colonel actually turned around the morale of an entire agency by putting in all these human capital ideas. Uh, he would do two cents Tuesday and, you know, undercover colonel where he would go around and, and sit uh, with his employees. But, you know, he took a really downtrodden organization and lifted it up uh, throughout the morale. And we thought that the programs he did were worthy of replicating throughout the agency. So we gave uh, that individual commendable for that. But normally what you'll see is a report and it'll have findings. Uh, findings will go to a criteria. Observations are, you know, just we think that this is something that the agency should pay attention attention to, not necessarily broken uh, with the criteria. And then if we do find something that needs corrections, we'll issue a recommendation. And that's where we work with GPO staff to meet that recommendation. So the GPO has to come back and say, we're going to implement your recommendation and here's how we do it. We try, meaning the OIG tries to tell you not how necessarily to do it. We just say what needs to be corrected. We want the agency to figure out the best way, the best economical and feasible way. Well, the last thing we as an OIG would want to do is recommend something that isn't feasible or would cost too much. That defeats the purpose of being uh, economic and efficient. So now I've talked to you about what we produce in our reports with findings and recommendations. This next slide shows you how to get it. We've got our own GPO site. Uh, if you go to the front page of GPO and business units and you can go down to Inspector General, in our audit inspections and information technology, you'll see our reports. Uh, you can see our findings, our recommendations. We've got a link specifically to recommendations so you can see what the agency has open and what they're working on. Now on the right side of the slide is oversight.gov. That is a IG community-wide, so the United States federal IG community, all reports that aren't classified and don't have uh, sensitive information can be put up on that report. Uh, there's, you know, and I just recently put two up from inspections for ours, and they rapidly get taken, you know, overcome because there's multiple reports showing up every day. But oversight.gov is, you know, as a taxpayer, you might be interested to see how your your different agencies throughout the government are spending your tax dollars. And, you know, that's, again, what the IG is for. The last bullet I put there is what's called the CIGI. It's the Council for Inspectors General for Integrity and Efficiency. They are our oversight. So you might ask yourself, well, who watches the watcher? You know, the OIG is providing oversight to GPO. Who provides oversight of the OIG? Well, that's the answer. It's SIGI. And they have a good website called IGNet.gov. And there's more information on IG than you'd ever want to know. But if you ever get curious, that's where you would go to. Now, uh, the final couple slides I want to leave you with is I, I talked a lot about what we do. And I talked a lot about, you know, how you can, uh, what you guys can report. If you have ideas though, not just for investigations or wrongdoing, but something where the agency could do a better job, you can get, you can submit this complaint form here. And that'll give us ideas for audits and inspections. And what we'll do with that is every year we plan, we plan our next year's audits and inspections. And this could be part of that, uh, that process by which we would consider ideas. And then most importantly, if you do have a report of a violation of law, rule, or, or regulation, if you want to report mismanagement or waste of funds, we do have a hotline. We have an email, and also on our website, you can uh, email us there too by clicking that link. Again, those are confidential. And I wanted to foot stomp again that, you know, if somehow someone finds out that you've made a, a complaint and they take reprisal action against you, that next bullet that talks about the Office of Special Counsel, you can file a complaint there and they will specifically deal with a whistleblower pr protection complaint. So your complaints to us are protected, and the Office of Special Counsel would be the people uh, to take care of that. Now, if this were a live session, I would ask for questions, but since you're listening to us at home, uh, that will be the last of my slides. So you can always feel free to reach out to me. Again, Nathan Deal, D-E-A-H-L. I'm in the GAL, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, and that is it.